Jesus is King. Welcome to the One Beer Five Podcast, rebuilding Christendom, restoring Catholic culture and tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, editor in chief of One Peter Five, and I'm joined today again by our contributing editor and author and all things SSBX apologist, Kennedy Hall. Kennedy, are you living the dream still in commie, commie Canada? I am, and that just uh, breaking news. It's I knew this. I've been telling you this for two years now, but. Uh, they actually did excavations of those alleged mass graves, and it turns out there was nothing there. So, shocker, ladies and gentlemen, the Catholic Church is not in the habit of running concentration camps where they throw poor little native children into mass graves and dispose of their bodies like the Nazis. Uh, I know you guys are all shocked, but that's not how the church operates, so they finally proved it. Yeah, we have uh, Thanksgiving for Columbus Day coming up very soon in October. Uh, we had our first annual Thanksgiving for Columbus Day, which happens on Columbus Day in, in the U.S. and Thanksgiving in Canada. So mm -hmm. look forward to that again in October. This is part two of our discussion about the SSPX, promoting Kennedy's book, SSPX, The Defense, with, with a, C. a C. The Defense is actually more intense with the C. It's, uh, it's, it's just more defense. defense. It's Latin. It's defense. <laughs> So you could you could buy this below. This is um, a response by Kennedy Hall to the various discussions that have happened over the past few years, really. Um, and it's really functions as a coda as we move on at one Peter five from really debating the SSBX as a as a um, sort of moral imperative absolute issue. Uh, we all trads all disagree about various minutiae regarding our movement, various things that the SSBX may hold and whatnot, but. What we do not debate is that the SSPX is certainly in the church. They are not in schism. They are our allies. And Archbishop Lefebvre is a hero and possibly a saint. So that those things are, are pretty obvious to, I think, most trads. But, I mean, I respect the conscience of trads who have a conscientious issue with various things. I respect you. But this is a conversation about various aspects of the SSPX. And this is celebrating the feast day of St. Pius X. So I think that th the first thing I want to ask you, uh, Kennedy, is why exactly did Archbishop Lefebvre choose St. Pius X as a patron of his Society of Priests? Well, because the SSPX was uh, created to form priests, um, and the priesthood was largely... Uh, denigrated after the council it was leading up to there as well you know as marshall always says vatican ii was the parade of things being planned beforehand um but the real the real issue was modernism and it's the issue we're dealing with today um pope pius x wrote Pascendi dominici gregis which was the landmark encyclical against modernism it's very difficult to read because it was written for bishops um and uses a lot of philosophical language, and these bishops were bishops formed in the 1800s, so clearly they had a classical education, so for us to just pick it up today, it's very difficult. Uh, but nonetheless, the spirit of the Society of St. Pius X is to uphold Catholic doctrine, uphold the uh, dignity of the priesthood, and there was no one greater than Pope Pius X to do so. Um, and another pope who did write amazingly against neo-modernism, which is slightly different than modernism, which is really the main problem we're dealing with, even if modernism is kind of its progenitor, was Pope Pius XII in Humanae Generis. Um, specifically, paragraph 15, he basically defines neo-modernism. Um, anyway, so Pius X was uh, chosen as the patron saint, and uh, there's actually an amazing hymn that uh, is sung by the SSPX, which was um, uh, published or composed, uh, for Pope Pius X, which I don't know if anyone else has heard, but if you're if your parish, because it is funny, some of these Latin Mass parishes uh, w that will tell you not to go to the SSPX, they do use the Angelus Press hymnals, um, and uh, in there you can find the hymn for Pope Pius X, and it's a great song. So the SSPX spreads devotion to Pius X. Is there? Is there I mean, is is uh, the feast day particularly celebrated in SSPX yes. chapels or the seminary? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. It's you know, it's kind of like you know the patron saint of the order or the the Society of Apostolic Life, if you want to put it that way. Um, so it's a big deal, right? Yeah, I, I know that uh, Saint Pius X is credited, obviously, with the oath against modernism and the, and the crusade against modernism. Yes. But he's also very well known, or he's not less not as well known, but we feel the effects of his pontificate, especially in 
the frequency of the reception of the of the blessed sacrament holy communion yes like he, he he was a really he did a huge uh thing on that obviously with his decrees on that he lowered the age of, of first holy communion and uh can you speak at all to particular his pious the tense uh work with priests i know he reformed the breviary which is sometimes controversial but he did so for the priests and yeah. he himself was a parish priest Yes. Um, any thoughts on Pius X in particular for his relationship to the priesthood? Sure. You know, this is the thing, um, if I can kind of take a long a side view of this to sort of frame it, um, often, you know, there's this caricature about the, the Society of St. Pius X as if it's this sort of ultra trad thing. Um, but really it's funny and I'm not criticizing someone being ultra trad. I'm just saying, um, <laughs> Really, I mean, when I look at, uh, you know, a lot of the sermons on lines from traditional priests that are not in the SSPX, I often find a greater insistence on the things we might consider to be, quote unquote, ultra traditional. Um, um, whereas in the SSPX, and you found this reading Archbishop Lefebvre's biography, there is this Aristotelian golden mean of moderation between two extremes. We're not talking about the via media of the Anglicans or the Hegelian dialectic of two opposing things, but you find this personified really well in Pope Pius X. So I, I know that there are going to be criticisms about from an intellectual and academic perspective about the change in the breviary, and I really have no uh, qualifications to get into those, if I'm being honest. Um, but the, in, the um, motivation for the change in the breviary was largely, and we hate this word nowadays, but it does have a good meaning when used properly, it was largely pastoral. Um, you know, you talk to these church historians who go on, about, who, who explain, basically, after the French Revolution, liberalism spreading in Europe, there's a, a lot less priests. You know, it was a vocation shortage, which seems like a golden age compared to now, but there really was, a, you know, a ton of priests left, especially in places like Italy. And the old office really required many hours a day to finish. Um, and uh, like any good pious tradition in the church over hundreds of years, it's going to have various additions and accretions, which are good, um, but from a practical perspective can make it difficult to continue with that sort of development and, and sustain the, the, the amount of things are required in order to do it. Similar arguments are made for the Holy Week thing, um, which I can't do here, uh, and I'm not qualified. Nonetheless, um, with the breviary, essentially, the demands of priests largely changed. Um, you know, today we're used to priests, uh, we've become used to priests, you know, having large areas where they have to travel between different parishes, families of parishes and things like this. Um, of course, in mission territory, that's very necessary. Um, there was a resurgence in vocations uh, in the first half of the 20th century, and especially in places like the United States, you know, there was a parish or two, priest or two for every parish, and the parishes only had 200 people, and there was 10 in a town kind of thing. That obviously... Um, allowed people lots of time for devotional prayers and things like that. But um, during this time of vocation shortage in Europe, you know, even if you read about, for example, in the time of uh, the Fatima children, you know, their little church in their village doesn't have mass all the time and they have to go to the bigger town and things like that. So you can just imagine priests having to travel around, not by car, you know, walking or, or animals or carriages or, or some rail if possible. And it's just difficult to keep up five, you know, four to five hours of, of office prayer in a day. So it was very much condensed um, for reasons of, of that nature. Whether or not people agree that the condensing of it uh, was as good as it should have been, I, I honestly, again, I can't qu comment on that. I'm not qualified, but that's the impetus for it. And this, yeah, it, sorry, go oh, on. Go ahead. I was just going to say, well, this, this spirit of, um, let's say, um, let's say a practical progressiveness or a practical progression, something like a, a useful adaptation to the changing times in which we live, which is a real thing. This is something that the SSPX has always embraced, um, which is why, again, when you get to know the priests, um, you know, you'd think you go to an SSPX parish, they're going to insist on all these, these uh, fasting rules as if they're binding. They're under no intent. They're under no um, impression that they have to insist on things that are not church law now on the faithful. They will recommend, you know, fast more and all these kinds of things, but they don't have an issue with these legitimate developments. Um, and that's something that the Society of St. Pius X uh, constantly has to sort of battle against within the traditional movement, because there is this right, understandable um, 
you know, Dietrich von Hildebrand talked about in, uh, integrism. It's used as a slur by the sort of neo-modernist types. It's not a slur, but integrism, uh, an integrist was someone in sort of the, you know, times uh, after the revolution and things like that in Europe, the various revolutions, who would hold to these traditional beliefs and perhaps dogmatize things that weren't necessarily actually dogmatic statements. Hildebrand talked about this, uh, these people being wonderfully pious, um, and they were not negative in the sense they didn't hold to any heresy, but there was perhaps maybe a defect in zeal um, uh, or, an, or, a, or a misapplication of zeal, which didn't allow for the legitimate debate that is allowed within Catholicism. Um, the SSPX is always fighting against these sorts of things because in the traditional movement, and, and I should say within their, not, not fighting other orders, but sort of within the atmosphere of, of the society, uh, parish and whatever, chapel, um, because with traditional Catholicism, I mean, things are so screwy, things are so crazy that there's this reactionary mentality where we're just going to reject all possible things that are less than 100 years old because they must be bad. Whereas we do know the Holy Ghost does guide the church, so there have been legitimate changes that do, that do reflect the changing in life. I mean, think, for example, with fasting rules. You know, what is the reason why fasting rules are largely loosened under Pope Leo XIII? I mean, really, you're a Catholic diaspora, and you're in North America, and you have a 12-hour shift six days a week, uh, and it's not a Catholic country, and they, they don't care about your fasting and things like that. Life does not slow down in the industrial age like it does in the agrarian age. So, you know, times of fasting in Europe during Lent were times when really not a lot got done anyway because it was not harvest season and it was not yet planting season. Um, it's the wisdom of the church's calendar and, you know, the divine order of the, the world and, and how this works with the liturgical year. These things correspond to times of laxity in sort of professional life. So if you're really tired and hungry, which you are when you fast, uh, that's okay in the months of March and early April because you don't have to be that productive. Um, you have to do your basic chores and daily tasks, but it's really a time of waiting. And then after Easter, it's, it's planting time, it's springtime, it's warmer, and then things ramp up and you're nourished and things like that for this time of, of really active agrarian life. Whereas in North America, that can't happen. So Pope Leo XIII says to himself, okay, listen, you're going to fall over and fall into the machine at your, at your shop you're working at if you're malnourished. <laughs> so sure, use, use beef, use animal fats and broth to have that sustenance you need. That's enough, but still suffer a bit. So these are, these are legitimate applications of prudential judgment by popes. And the SSPX has always tried to inculcate in the faithful that these things are legitimate and we should embrace them because that's part of the sort of real spirit of obedience to to things that our betters know are better for us if that makes sense yeah this is you made mention of the fact that uh i am i am not i've never really regularly attended an sspx chapel and i'm just sort of studying the fab and the sspx from the outside and and that's that has been my experience of reading his biography especially when when we learn about our special fabs time in Africa and himself as a priest and missionary and bishop and what he's doing uh, for his own priests. I remember the story of how he, there was uh, his priests were celebrating multiple masses in the bush in this malaria infested uh, extreme heat. And so he, he just dispensed them from certain rubrics of the mass, which disallowed them from taking any water or some, or he, he, he took, there was like one less, one less liturgical undergarment that they had to wear or something like that. So they didn't die of heat exhaustion between the masses, things like that, which is just, it's sort of like, this is common sense, but it's just sort of, uh, it shows how, how much the SSPX, uh, our, his, its founder, uh, following Pius X, uh, are forming these priests, not as these ideologues as they are cal calumniated as, but really, priests who who have a, 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 a the tr the true virtue of prudence and and piety, so they're they are passing down the tradition, but they're also modifying various things that can be modified. That it's it's allowed to modify various things for the sake of the salvation of souls, so that that end goal is always being reached. We're not changing from the right hand to the left of that end goal, but we are changing certain things. So this so this brings up. I think it's, this is good to start with sort of we are conceding the SSPX is saying, yes, there is a development. It's true. There is a true forward development. You wanted to add something. Go ahead. Oh, that was it. Yeah, no, you're good. Oh, OK, Go um, so then we we get to the the what Pius X is most famous for is the condemnation of modernism. Yes. So I, I, why don't we start with that quote from from Pope Francis, because it's very sure. interesting that 
this is the the, the so-called development of doctrine uh, the tricky thing is that um it that development itself has not been definitively defined in exhaustive language there's various things that have been like, like the anathema from Pi, from vatican one for example anathematizes an evolution of doctrine that is actually yeah. anathematized and the oath against modernism says certain things that i will hold to the same sense and same understanding but nowadays that's that's revoked and we have pope francis quoting the same guy uh saint vincent of Laren, to sort of say well now the death penalty is a sin so what happened recently comments on that to contextualize our conversation sure so this is from the vatican news website uh so for everyone out there going to say you're not translating pope francis properly take it up with the vatican i guess you know better than them um which makes you schismatic but anyway um <laughs> <laughs> the, Vatican, the Vatican website under, under the heading Doctrinal Development, this was an address given to some Jesuits, and, I'm, and this is them summarizing what he said. Okay. And he said, uh, Pope Francis underscored the dynamic nature of doctrinal evolution uh, and expounded on the notion that church doctrine is not an unchanging monolith, but rather an evolving entity. He invoked historical instances such as the changing perspectives on the death penalty, nuclear weapons, and slavery to illustrate the fluidity of doctrine over time. There are 50 million problems with this. Um, but this is a classic neo-modernist, and we can talk about neo-modernism as we go. Neo-modernism was really defined by Pius XII, excuse me, uh, in paragraph 15, if you might be generous, like I said. But, but th the evolution of doctrine is modernism par excellence. There are basically two or three pillars to modernism. There's agnosticism, um, which is, uh, today we think of an agnostic as someone who uh, just isn't sure if they believe in God or not. That's kind of a colloquial term, but it's really a philosophical persuasion, whereas, well, we can't really know for certain, okay? So first it's in philosophy, and then it's in theology, okay? Uh, there's vital imminence, which is basically, um, you know, I know the truth of something religious by my religious sense, and this is a very attractive truth because it is partly true, you know, for example, when you go to a retreat, let's say, with a traditional retreat, and you are discerning some big decision in life, and you pray about it, at a certain point, you may be convinced that you know what to do. So there is this aspect of, yes, I do, I do have this sensus catholicus, I do, but this is, if this is more than just something bubbling up inside of your spirit that is just amorphous. This is the result of formation and sacraments and wisdom and, and prayer and, 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 and catechism and so forth. And then you come to the right conclusion based on basically having the information and cogitating on it in a prayerful setting. That's not the same thing as the modernist understanding of, of a religious sense at all. And then finally, um, you have uh, the evolution of doctrine, doctrine or dogma. And this is the evolution of doctrine is the necessary offspring of agnosticism and vital imminence because, and this is laid out uh, very succinctly in, in Pashendi, and I recommend, um, we don't have all the time to go over it here in the detail I did with Father McGilvery, but I did interview Father McGilvery the other day on my channel, and we do talk about modernism. Uh, in depth, we spent about two hours going through the big highlights of Pashendi, and um, and it's very clear in Pashendi that basically when you have these problems in philosophy, you end up necessarily having these problems in religion, and evolution of doctrine follows clearly from agnosticism, because you're not sure, and then towards vital imminence, meaning that the truth of religion sort of corresponds with the sense of the religious person. This is why a modernist over time can say with a straight face that they believe doctrine is objective, but they believe necessarily that objective reality must correspond with the changing reality of the sense of the person, which is why it's so hard to pin modernism down. It's like trying to grab a snake underwater, which makes sense that it's serpentine because it's satanic. Um, so, you know, this is why even in conservative Catholicism today, you know, I won't name any persons or anything, but in conservative Catholicism, you will find well-known apologists saying things like, well, doctrine can change. And it's like, well, sort of, and you outline this in your, um, on your website, Tim, when you talk about the theological notes of Ludwig Ott. Yes, there was the lowest level, the, the, was the sentencia probabilis or sentencia communis or whatever the lowest level is. Yes, uh, the analogy you use, which is I think from Ott, when, you know, it's commonly held that Judas received Holy Communion at the Last Supper. 
this is something that has not really been defined and um, and people can disagree. And it could be that that could be held sort of as a general belief for many, many years. And then that thing could be uh, defined in a way that is different than that. So someone might say, well, there's something like doctrine changing. Well, if by doctrine we mean teaching in general, sure, teachings in, in the general sense of a doctrine is anything that is taught, this could include disciplinary doctrines, this could include liturgical doctrines and things. But as far as a doctrine insofar as something that is of the Catholic faith, it is impossible for those things to change. And this is where the confusion comes in. Yeah, so the this is why the, the certain phrases are so important uh, to use, like there's the same sense and the same understanding. So we're using the, there is a development, but we do it according to the same sense and the same understanding. Uh, I just looked up what the neo-modernism is. Before I say that, actually, I wanted to mention something interesting is that, it, you know, if critics say that we're, you know, we're kind of crazy with neo-modernism, that there's this Ashendi is still relevant. Uh, there's an interesting admission that Paul VI makes in his January 19, 1972 address, where he says that there is still modernism rampant in the church. And he mentions, according to Pius X's definition of it. And so he's, yeah. he's, he's saying what we're saying right here. Paul VI admits the same thing here. So this is not, you know, critics can, and can take it up with Paul VI there. Uh, here's, here's what Pius XII says in yes, Humani Generis. And I think that this is an interesting aspect of it. Uh, at paragraph 15 that you mentioned, so he there he's critiquing those these neo modernists and he's saying they do not consider it absurd but altogether necessary that theology should substitute new concepts in place of the old ones in keeping with various philosophies which in the course of time it uses as its instruments so that it should give in human expression to divine truths in various ways which are even somewhat opposed but still equivalent as they say I, and what I think of right now is the term transubstantiation we just had so-and-so Jesuit over in America just say a couple months ago, he doesn't believe it. He believes in the real presence, but not transubstantiation. Well, Pius XII yeah. is saying you have to use the same terms because we use these two, even though they're, you know, they're sort of dated, if you will, because they're from Aristotle or whatever, but the church has utilized them. Therefore, we have to preserve them and keep them passed down. Yeah, and they're perfect terms. This is, they, they, you know, you can't get better than certain terms because they encompass what is need what is needed, um, and again, but this represents that there is a development of doctrine because, again, the word doctrine, in the loose sense, doctrine just literally means teaching. Um, if you look up doctrine synonyms in the thesaurus, you'll find dogma, doctrine, creed, uh, teachings. They're all the same thing, and this is one thing too. That is, I think, in a lot in the, in the mind of a lot of Catholics, they would say, "Well, dogma is that really strong one, but doctrine is the really weak one, or something like that." When really they're just synonymous with one another, but dogma seems like a more religious word because, you know, um, for example, they'll talk about military doctrine. You know, people who go to the military they say we have military doctrines. You could say military dogma, but the word dogma is just associated with Catholicism, even though they are synonyms. Um, so if you look at the history of the development of doctrine, before, before Aristotle was accepted as the sort of philosophical system, um, largely the terms were often very platonic. And Platonism does offer a lot of useful terms, um, but there are limits to how to uh, tackle certain questions of knowing and being using Platonism that do at times leave open the door for certain errors. You know, for example, Plotinus was a Neoplatonist who greatly inspired Augustine. And Plotinus, and that was good, it, it, it inspired Augustine to go away from Manichaeism because this Neoplatonism of Plotinus was very useful. But Neoplatonism has been used as a philosophical background for Gnosticism and Islam, uh, because the door is left open for things like that. Whereas in um, uh, uh, Aristotelian philosophy, and considering Aristotle comes after his teacher Plato, he sort of picks up where Plato left off and, and corrects certain errors or certain, um, put, um, le the certain places where there's a potential for misunderstanding. So even the idea that we use Aristotelian philosophy 
as the basis for Thomistic language in the church. This in and of itself does represent a development or a progression in understanding. And this is why the neo-modernists are so dangerous. Pope Francis, um, in the actual transcript um, where he's talking to um, where he's talking to the Jesuits, he does say that um, basically we evolve in our understanding of doctrine over time. And this is partly true. This is, this is partly true. But what needs to be added to that is then we know, so we stop on certain things. Like transubstantiation is defined. That's what it is. We don't say, well, we're going to re-understand transubstantiation. No, you can say we might understand it better, but it has to be in the same sense. And people understand this in the legal sphere. You know, when people talk about the Supreme Court, we understand intrinsically that judges who basically redefine what it means to have a gun or something like that, we just know they're off their rocker because they're just making it up as they go along. Whereas someone who tries to understand in the way the founders understood things, we intrinsically understand they're, they're doing them justice. A similar thing has to be done in the church, otherwise we get into heresy. Yeah, and a very simple definition of a true development of doctrine from Father Reginald Gary Grange is simply making explicit something that was already implicit. So transubstantiation is a term that it gets introduced. So in the, in, in the sense it's new, it's a new term because we didn't use it before, but now we're going to use it again, use it for the first time. But it's just making explicit what we had previously held. We believed that before, but we just didn't express it in that term. And in, in, in um, Letter to Confused Catholics, Archbishop yeah. Lefebvre makes mention of just numerous examples, especially in the French church, but it was happening everywhere where bishops were publishing these catechisms or just people were just publishing catechisms and they were messing with the liturgy and they were introducing all sorts of new terms and new doctrines. And they were saying that this is, we're, we're, they weren't even trying to make this work. They were just saying, well, we're changing. That, that's the way it is. You know, exactly the same type of language that is used to justify when Pope Francis says the death penalty, we understand something better. Our, our understanding of human nature and human dignity has evolved. It's changed. We used to think that, we, but now we think this. So there's no attempt to create a continuity between A and B. They're simply saying, we're just changing to, to B. Th that can never be. That can never be legitimate. There always has to be a continuity between the developments in tradition. Yes, and this is, I'm going to say something here that will be challenging for people. Um, even in some of the more conservative theologians like Ratzinger over the years, people need to be on guard for this Hegelian, and I'll define basically, we'll, we'll talk about he Hegel real quickly. Hegel was a philosopher, somewhat contemporary to Kant, and um, basically the idea of Hegel is you have thesis and antithesis and you get synthesis, Okay. So you have one truth, you have another statement of fact, whether it's true or not, and you sort of smash them together and you get the new thing, which is like the super thing. And this is kind of a perversion of the Aristotelian golden mean between extremes. So the golden mean between extremes is we have prudence and we have fortitude. And we can't be prudent to the point where we reject the other virtues and it no longer is prudence and we can't be fortuitous to the point where we reject prudence if that makes sense so you have to have a, a, a you have to have a balance between these extremes one can be accentuated at different times but you can't reject the rest hegel is basically saying you have oil and you have water and you smash them together you get a new thing okay at best you can put oil and vinegar and get a salad dressing but that's not the same thing so um with the uh this is this is how we see these reactions so we have this liberalism that is in the 1800s and 1700s, which is necessary for modernism. Liberalism basically starts in the civil sphere, and um, and this ties. And so, before I get into another tangent, liberalism basically rejects the rights of the church and the society. Okay, uh, that's that's essentially liberalism. Okay, um, and and that takes away the kingship of Christ, and this is a preliminary to modernism. Uh, because it, the analogy, I'm actually writing a new book right now. I won't tell everyone what it is, but I'm talk, talking about these issues. Um, it's about modernism, but I won't tell you the title. And um, basically, if, if, if the this, this church and the state as sort of necessary friends, necessary buddies, okay, uh, for the order of society, 
you have something like the armor, which is the state, and you have something like the heart, which is the church, okay? And when you take down the armor, then you go after the heart, okay? There's something like that. There's an analogy there somewhere. The walls of the, the cathedral is in the walled city. The, the, the state is the walls, and the heart is, is the church in the middle. Um, you have to take down the walls and the armor first, which is why these enemies of the church go after the state. They go after the conception of, of Catholicism as the true religion of the state. Necessarily, if you reject the kingship of Christ, then you ultimately have to reject, as a philosophical consequence, the primacy of Catholicism as the only true religion. Not only the religion that is for society, but the religion that is true in and of itself. Okay. Um, so this is, this is why, historically, we basically have liberalism first, and then we have modernism second. And you can actually find this in William of Ockham, if you go back even 700 years. William of Ockham, we know Ockham's razor, the simplest answer is the best, or however he explains it. Um, um, he wasn't condemned in the same way we would understand his ideas being condemned now, because these ideas hadn't really gained traction. They didn't flourish in the same way that they are now. But I'm researching him for my book, and William of Ockham um, demonstrated all of the characteristics of a modernist. Um, he protested against Thomistic philosophy. Pius X and Pashendi says there is no surer sign of modernism than a dislike of Thomas. <laughs> um, and, you know, literally, it's very clear. Um, and he, uh, William of Ockham, uh, his two major errors were essentially secular absolutism, where the state uh, did not have rights over the, or the church did not have rights over the state in some capacity, uh, and nominalism which denied, uh, he had a misunderstanding of Aristotle where he denied that we could essentially know the essences of things, okay? Um, where we, so basically we, we could use the term flower to appeal to a flower, but that's really just a placeholder term. We don't actually understand the essence of what a flower is. This is fixed by proper Aristotelianism in, in St. Thomas, but this was rejected by, by, yeah. by Occam. Eventually this is picked up by the reformers, the Protestantism and so on and so forth. And we see this sort of con suppressed but, but flowering and bubbling up under the surface. Um, so we have this modernism, which is clearly insane, and the major proponents of it are basically Loisy and uh, um, Tyrell, these two priests that were officially condemned. And they were really out to lunch. I talk about this at length with Father McGilvery. Um, they, they were like, these were, these would have made James Martin look kind of conservative. Like they were yes. far beyond. So it was visible. Pius, the, the, the encyclical is basically about those two priests. Um, and they were both uh, basically condemned within a year or two after it was, it was published. Okay. Um, one of which I think Loisy ended up leaving the faith altogether and calling himself more of a humanist by the time he died. Whereas Tyrell still called himself a Catholic, but, uh, but anyway, but was a heretic. So, um, so what happens is, is clearly modernism is condemned. It's obvious what modernism is in the most explicit sense. So then what happens? Well, basically it goes underground and it has to reformulate. The devil never stops. So he, he, he you know, he has, he, 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 he makes up new tactics to do the same objective essentially. And then by the time Pope Pius XII comes around, you have this neo-modernism, which we explained. So here's the thing. In the philosophical schools, and we see this as Ratzinger and others, they literally say things like, we were basically tired of Thomas, okay? We were basically bored with Thomas Aquinas. We wouldn't go so far as to say they rejected or protested against him in a, in a, in a violent sense, which you'd see in, a, in, a, in the true modernism. But there was this persuasion of, well, we have modernism, which is condemned, and we have this sort of rigidity of this Thomistic manualism, which even... Lefebvre says was a problem. So now we sort of have to find the synthesis between those two instincts. And this is where we have the very Balthazarian, very Bishop Baronian, whatever the term would be, Bar Baronian way of looking at things where we can't really say they're liberals. We can't really say that they're modernists in the sense of like, he's like a Tyrell or a Loisy, because clearly they're not. But at the same time, there is an inherent ambiguity left open in the way certain terms are used, which does allow them to play footsies with the heretics. Okay. And, and this is why it's so painful. I, I, I painful to watch figures like Bishop Barron, who is obviously very intelligent. And, you know, on the one hand, he's lamenting that we've sort of dumbed down the faith. He said this the other day and he's being attacked for it, which is hilarious. Now they're going after Scott Hahn and Bishop Barron and pretty much everybody's a trad now. So, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, he's he's lamenting that. But at the same time, he's still adopting the theory, the, the, the hypothesis, the ideas of the revolution in a sense, because there's this inherent compromise built within. And this this is the Novus Ordo. This is this is the idea that and this is expressly expressed perfectly by Paul VI on the eve of promulgating, where he basically says, well, we're going to lose all the sacredness. We're going to lose all the great stuff. We're going to lose literally everything that's awesome. And yeah. then, but, but we need modern vernacular for the people. So we can, like Hegel, we can smash these two things together. And then we can find something through the chaos. And this idea of having good come out of chaos is union. This is not Catholic. Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll have this liturgy. Now, even there is a tempering after that by Ratzinger. Um, and then when he becomes when he becomes Pope Benedict, he is much more conservative, in fairness, than his early years as, as Father Ratzinger. Um, and this is uh, illuminated very well by um, Farrar and Great Facade, Farrar and Woods. Um, but what does Benedict tell us? Well, we need to have this mutual enrichment. We need to have this reform of the reform. This is, again, falling into this persuasion of while well, these two things are opposite, the Novus Ordo and the traditional Mass clearly are not compatible with one another. I mean, just look at the, the state of everything, at least in the way they're practiced. But if we have them sort of help each other out, then we'll come through this confusion and we'll have what we actually are looking for. Um, or, okay, the reform was bad. We need to reform that reform. You see this continual... Um, it's this persuasion amongst this neo-modernist spirit that has infected even the conservatives in the church, where because there's this inherent idea that something must progress in order for it to be alive, this is vital imminence, they're not willing to say, we literally just have to stop with what we're doing and scrap it and go back to what works. And this is why we are, it's like traditionalists in the church, we're fighting with one hand behind our back. Benedict offers us this brief respite uh, but because the respite doesn't actually, it doesn't actually exterminate the philosophical root of the problem, it just is cast aside for a bit. And then when it has freedom again, it comes out. Yeah, there is a, as you mentioned, there is a, there is a certain rigidity going on somewhere that people overreact to. But, and, and there is, as we said in the beginning, there is a legitimate development that can occur. But I, I think that the, the main aspect that makes it so problematic is that they promulgate the new mass and they abolish the old. It, it would be one thing to say, well, we're going to give this optional thing that might, people might get into it. We're going to yeah. give this optional thing over here, but we're going to keep everything we passed down. Everything's being kept exactly the way it was, but we're just going to introduce something to something new. That's the truth. I think that that's the traditional way that the church introduces new things is that yes. the church introduces something new because it might work. Maybe, you know, like the Dominicans, for example, that was a new, that was like the hippie thing that was like, wow, St. Thomas is going off with the Dominicans. His family was freaking out because they're this new order. That's, Who are these people? They're crazy. But that worked out. <laughs> Dominicans were great. It turned out great. You know, introducing new things. The church can introduce new things. But the, the what the church cannot do is abolish the old. And I think that even even though I, I do think that many of the critiques of Vatican II by trads are often very weak and superficial, the, the main thing that Le, Archbishop Lefebvre comes along, he founds the SSPX, and he's saying, why can we not do exactly what we were doing literally 10 years ago? Why is that somehow illegal? Because that right there shows that we have a Hegelian situation here. Because we can't, he, Hegel says we're going to mash two opposite things together and create something new. That cannot be you. You can't you can't you have to be able to introduce something new, but keep the same thing as it was before. Keep that tradition going. That's to me, that's the red flag that that makes everything not work is that you can't abolish what came before. Yeah, and, and people often. You know, people often. Uh, this is why the SSPX is so providentially necessary in this era that we're in. Because, and I don't mean this as a criticism of any other order and things like that, but the traditional orders that are not the SSPX, the diocesan priests who are doing their, their darndest to keep things afloat, that are traditionally minded, implicitly they still have to operate within the new springtime. Um, they can't 
they can't really separate themselves in any meaningful way uh, lest they lose their juridical standing and all those sorts of things. Whereas the SSPX kind of has a certain freedom where um, there's really no, there's no bending of the knee or compromise that has to be made. So, so, and I'm not accusing it, I'm just saying this is the, this is the, the, the spirit of the thing. So when, when people talk about the Second Vatican Council, um, even in the thought of Archbishop Lefebvre, there's this development of understanding of how to approach the Second Vatican Council. And really what it comes down to, and Bishop Fillet gave, uh, I recommend everyone take a look at this if they want, he gave a, um, like, a, like a conference lecture thing in Singapore, um, and it's online, you can look it up, Bishop Fillet, it's from like four months ago or something. And he says, you know, it's funny, I get in trouble with traditionalists because I say 95% of Vatican II is totally fine, you know. Um, but that, but the, but but the 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 um, resistance to certain parts of Vatican II, it's it's almost more prudential than anything, um, because it is possible, for example, to look at the term subsists in, you know, the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. It is possible to look at it and say that it is orthodox. It's also possible to look at it and say that it's not orthodox. So the the problem is not that the term could be orthodox. The problem is that the term could not be orthodox which is really a matter of prudence rather than a matter of saying you are explicitly a heretic. And the church has vindicated this over the years because in 2007 under the CDF, Ratzinger, or under Ratzinger, they come out and basically put out this note saying, well, no, no, the church is the church of Christ. And this is how it has to be understood. So when Lefebvre is saying, I accuse the council, j'accuse le conseil, you know, that's famous work of his from the 70s or whenever it was. Um, this, is, this is, people have lost their sense of history as well. This is what theologians do. The theologians of the past, like Thomas Aquinas was accused of heresy uh, by his contemporaries. You know, his, he was almost suppressed in some ways. You know, this idea of using Aristotle was seen as radical. Look at the plight of, of St. Ignatius of Loyola. We could think of many other examples. Um, St. Saint, Saint Alphonsus Liguori. Okay. Um, so when you understand that the Second Vatican Council provides uh, explanations but no define dogmas and you find these ambiguities it is the job of a bishop and theologian to say iron sharpens iron i'm this is why this there's a problem here you need to show me why there's not because that is the job of the church um and over time we've seen what are the major what are the major problems the society and the traditional theologians the good ones have had with the council it's mainly to do with religious liberty it's mainly to do with um uh the ends of marriage it's mainly to do with um, uh, essentially a collegiality, which is oh, come on synodality. People like we don't think that's a problem, and 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 uh, and it's mainly to do with um, sort of the mystical body of Christ. Okay, those are the main areas essentially, and we find these error these errors sort of hinted at here and there. And this is why, I mean, uh, 20, this is an article at one Peter five from before your time. But Archbishop Pozzo, when he was having his negotiations with the SSPX. He said Catholics are not under the obligation to accept Nostra Aetate or uh, Unitatis Retin Gratio and these various documents talking about other religions because he says they are novelties but they, and therefore they're not binding. And this is what the society has been saying all along. And over time, because of their, because of their insistence that this be clarified, it's either clarified like with subsists in where there's an actual clarification on how to interpret it. Thank you, church. Or it's admitted that, well, no, they actually can't be binding because really there is no way to reconcile this with um, Orthodox traditional Catholic teaching, um, and therefore it's a pastoral suggestion, basically. Okay, so even amongst the traditional Catholic world with the criticisms of the Second Vatican Council, um, I think one of the best bishops who uh, sort of explains what, what would be the society's position on the council, Bishop uh, Schneider has come through and basically said, there just has to be certain clarifications and we have to, you know, it's not an infallible council, admittedly so. That doesn't mean it's not a council, but it's just, uh, you know, this was, um, whichever theologian it was, it was either Cajetan or Bellarmine or one of those, Melchior Cano, around the time of the Council of Trent and after that. And they were talking about the Council of Trent, talk about a super council, and they were saying that in that council, things that were not anathematized or dogmatized don't have the character of infallibility. And this is Trent we're talking about. So if we can say this about Trent, which is very clear, clearly we can apply this principle to the Second Vatican Council. Uh, so Bishop Schneider, for example, would say, these things have to be clarified. And we have to say, this has happened, this has been clarified, this is where we go from here. Uh, whereas 
someone like Bishop Vigano has a, a, has a response that doesn't fit really with the SSPX's is ecclesiology or theology, is that the council itself needs to be sort of burned to ashes and taken away. Um, uh, this is a, a position that that uh, isn't really reflected in the society's doctrinal negotiations with Rome anyway. So, that, but again, here we see there's a, there's a there is a temptation towards an extreme in reaction on behalf of Catholics, both non-traditional and traditional. The non-traditional, because of the, this, is the funny thing: since Vatican II is not dogmatic in the tr- tr- technical in the uh, traditional sense of the term. No one knows what to do with it. <laughs> so it's like, well, we don't know what to do with it, so no dissent allowed. Whereas the, 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 the you know, it's like, well, okay, great. Uh, it's just like in the state. We have freedom of religion except for yours because yours actually doesn't let the other ones have freedom, so freedom mm-hmm. not for you. You know, it's that sort of thing. Um, whereas in the sort of reactionary position that can be common in traditionalism, it's like, well, because there's ambiguities, you know, there's no pope and burn it to the ground. Um, <laughs> you know? Whereas the SSPX is saying, well, no, like it's a council. There's things in it that are completely fine. Uh, and there's things that make you scratch your head. So really, it's up to the authorities of the church to explain how we can interpret this in light of tradition. Yes, excellent. Um, I, I, this Again, this moderation of the Fev, which is this true moderation from Pius X. So we've got about five minutes left. Pius X and Marcel Lefebvre, hammers of modernism. Final thoughts, Kennedy Hall. Sure. Well, there's a Roman expression, nomen est omen. Uh, the name Marcel literally means hammer, and the name Lefebvre means blacksmith. And um, and I say this in my um, I say this in my uh, my talk that I gave my SSPX talk I gave in the summer at the Council Priests Conference. Uh, you know, Archbishop Lefebvre, in the spirit of Pius X, he was a hammer of modernism, and he and he created a foundry of these holy priests. Um, you know, there's there's um, it's funny, Lefebvre's name is actually uh, Marcel Marie-Joseph François Lefebvre. So uh, he's uh, the hammer, Mary and Joseph, Frenchman, François, Francis, and uh, Lefebvre. And um, I think it is very fitting that uh, the, the, the real revolution in the church really is the French Revolution, which should be called the World Revolution. It was the, it was the prototype for the rest of them. Um, it, it's a Frenchman who offers us a resistance toward the spirit of revolution that has plagued the church. And, and Cardinal Soon literally calls it the French Revolution in the church, you know, so that there, there, there's that. So so Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, in the spirit of Pius X, is this hammer of modernism. Um, and again, you, you, you see this in the moderation. You see this in the moderation. You know, people get on the SSPX all the time about not doing the pre-55 Holy Week. And if you talk to the odd, the odd um, SSPX priests, they'll have their opinions about if they could prefer one or the other. But they recognize that, well, actually, I should say, if you go to a a pre-55 Holy Week, ladies and gentlemen, which uses Pope Benedict's prayer for the Jews, you actually aren't even getting the thing that you're supposed to get out of the pre-55 Holy Week, which is the conversion of the perfidious Jews, as it says. Whereas if you follow the the original 55 Holy Week Missal, you'll still find the word perfidious in it. So there's a little irony there. um, uh, but they, but you, you talk to these priests and they say, listen, like, yeah, I mean, it could be, it could be argued that we should use the pre 55. And I, I know Dr. K would really argue that and right. I would never want to argue him on it. And, um, uh, but they say, but this is a legitimate development. The faith has not been endangered. This has come from legitimate authority. And if we allow ourselves to pick and choose with the liturgy, then we become, you know, basically preferentialists. And this is why they use a 62 missile, not an earlier one, you know, because 62 was fine. Some would say they shouldn't put Joseph in the canon. Well, maybe someone who is in the position of authority could argue that that was an accretion that shouldn't be allowed. But the SSPX says, we're not here to be the arbiters of what is Catholic tradition. We're here to uphold Catholic tradition as such and nothing more. Excellent. Well, everyone go buy Kennedy's book, SSPX, The Defense. You can buy that at the link below. Let's offer up an Ave Maria. We'll invoke our patrons here at 1 Peter 5, including Sister Wilhelmina. Nomine Patri, Sipidi, Spiritu Sancti, Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre, Amen. 
Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. Blessed Emperor Carl. Pray for us. Saint Maximilian Kolbe. Pray for us. Sister Wilhelmina. Pray for us. Nomine Patris et Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen.